Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stan Stovall, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast, CMS Journal, Volume 1, Pressure Ulcer Care. Before we proceed with the program, let's hear from Mr. Thomas Hamilton, who is the director of the Survey and Certification Group in CMS's Center for Medicare and State Operations. Hello, I'm Thomas Hamilton, director of the Survey and Certification Group in the Center for Medicaid and State Operations at CMS. Welcome to the CMS series of satellite presentations on significant clinical and regulatory issues that affect the quality of care for our nation's nursing home residents. We are calling this series the CMS Nursing Home Journal. Each installment in the series will provide the most up-to-date clinical information on each selected topic for both surveyors and providers. Each volume of the journal will be devoted to a different, specific issue and will include presentations by top clinicians who specialize in that topic. The CMS Nursing Home Journal satellite and webcast series will be an ongoing accompaniment to the other work we have undertaken to update our interpretive guidance for surveyors. In each installment, one of our surveyors will provide the surveyor's point of view and will enlist the help of our experts in answering some of the questions that surveyors most need to know about the changing field of practice. Each show will include call-in and fax capability so that you, as participating surveyors and providers, will be able to ask your questions of the experts. Healthcare is an exciting, important, and dynamic field. We are all challenged to stay up to date with our ever-changing environment of practice. I hope this first in a series of broadcasts will help you in doing so. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your commitment to improve the delivery of services for residents in our nation's nursing homes. As Mr. Hamilton said, today's program is the first of a series of satellite webcasts that CMS will be doing on important issues of nursing home care. Today's program is on pressure ulcer care and will include the following major topics, physiology, assessment and prevention strategies, treatment of pressure ulcers, end-of-life care issues, and current developments in the field. And we have gathered a panel of experts to help us to present both surveyors and nursing home providers the most up-to-date information about the prevention and treatment of pressure ulcers. We will be having a question and answer period periodically during this program. So in order to call in your question, then you should dial the number you see on your screen right now, 1-800-953-2233. Again, if you'd like to phone it in, 1-800-953-2233. If you prefer to fax your question to us, then you should dial 1-410-786-0123. Again, the number is 1-800-953-2233 for the phone calls, 1-410-786-0123 to fax in your question. And this program will also be available on the website for one full year after the broadcast date at cms.internetstreaming.com. All right, now that we have all of the technical things out of the way, all the details, let's get started with the program. I want to let you know that today's program contains some graphically explicit slides and video clips of actual pressure ulcers and their treatment. The video clips that you will be seeing during this program were provided by Medcom Incorporated. The video is titled Prevention, Assessment, and Treatment of Pressure Ulcers, which can be purchased by calling the number 1-800-877-1443. That number again, 1-800-877-1443. But we're going to begin today's program with an introduction to the topic by our CMS Regional Office Nurse Surveyor, Sharon Roberson. Sharon is a nurse consultant with the Boston Regional Office of CMS. She has been with CMS since 1991. She's a registered nurse and a contributing instructor at both the National Long-Term Care Basic Training and Hospital Basic Training. She has been a nursing home administrator, and Sharon recently participated in CMS's two-part broadcast on dementia in the nursing home setting. Sharon, good to see you and welcome back. Thanks, Dan. It's, I'm glad to be back. Now, I understand this is, uh, that this satellite is one of the first in a series that uh, are coming out of the project in the Division of Nursing Homes. Uh, give us, our viewers, a little more idea what that's about. That's right, Stan. The CMS Division of Nursing Homes has been engaged in a project to upgrade the guidance to surveyors in key regulatory areas. CMS, along with their contractor, the American Institutes for Research, has been convening expert panels 
to provide the latest state-of-the-art guidance about each selected issue. As the work of each expert panel is completed and the new guidance is made ready for issuance, CMS intends to provide a satellite broadcast as a training aid to surveyors. The first regulatory area selected for revising severe guidance is pressure ulcer care. Yeah, and Sharon, I understand that uh, pressure ulcers uh, are a serious medical problem uh, uh, to a nursing home resident's health and certainly the quality of her life. Stan, it certainly is true that pressure ulcers are a serious issue and one that surveyors spend a lot of time investigating during surveys. CMS, Congress, and the General Accounting Office have been interested in the issue of pressure ulcers for some time now. CMS's is Nursing Home Initiatives of 1999 made the evaluation of each facility's program to prevent and treat pressure ulcers as a key part of the survey process. At that time, the new CMS database opened with a set of 24 quality indicators, or QIs, that surveyors and providers could use to determine the relative prevalence of several clinical conditions across facilities in each state. The indicators included pressure ulcers. The availability of this new data has allowed CMS to track the prevalence of pressure ulcers across time, nationally and in each state. In addition, it is CMS's goal under the Government Performance and Results Act, called GIPRA, to decrease the national prevalence of pressure ulcers in nursing homes. Providing education to surveyors and providers on this issue is part of CMS's response to the GIPRA goal. And in addition, the Quality Improvement Organizations, or QIOs, who work under contract to CMS are also involved in pressure ulcer initiatives and have developed educational packages for use in long-term care facilities. Two important websites which are being shown in your screen contain information about the QIO pressure ulcer projects. One is the National Nursing Home Improvement Collaborative, sponsored by the Washington State QIO, Qualis Health, and another site called MedQuick, which is the Medicare Quality Improvement Clearinghouse. At a later date, we will be adding some relevant documents from each of the sites to the CMS website for the show. All right, speaking of the website, Sharon, let me just remind our viewers that the website for this broadcast is www.cmsinternetstreaming.com. Let me give it to you again, www.cmsinternetstreaming.com. Okay, Sharon, I understand that uh, you have a lot of information regarding the prevalence or proportion of uh, residents with pressure type ulcers. Uh, fill us in and bring us right up to date on that. I recently reviewed data from our MDS set, or the Minimum Data Set System, for the time period ending March of 2004. The database contains the records of about 1.4 million residents in over 16,000 nursing homes. I pulled my data from the CMS Nursing Home Compare site, which is open to the public at the address on your screen. The nursing home compare site shows that 14.3% of high-risk residents, as well as 2.8% of those residents who are not at high risk, have a pressure ulcer. High-risk residents are those who have less mobility, may be undernourished, or other conditions that places them at risk for the development of a pressure ulcer. The data are based on quality measures and includes residents who have been at a facility for at least three months. The data includes residents who have any stage of ulcer. Taking the above figures, we have calculated that the overall national prevalence is approximately 9.2%. I want to make the point, though, that the presence of a pressure ulcer does not necessarily mean that the facility has provided poor care. In fact, some residents are admitted with a pressure ulcer or multiple ulcers. Other residents may not have been admitted with an ulcer, but have commonly known clinical risk factors that do place them at risk for developing one. We have a regulation for nursing homes that addresses their responsibilities in this area. This regulation at F314 has two parts, the development of a pressure ulcer and the treatment. For residents admitted with a pressure ulcer and residents who developed a pressure ulcer while in the facility, 
The surveyor needs to determine whether the facility is in compliance with the portion of the regulation at tag F314. This tag requires that the resident receive the necessary treatment and services to promote healing, prevent infections, and prevent new ulcers from developing. In addition, for a resident who developed an ulcer while in the facility, the surveyor must also make a determination of whether the development of the pressure ulcer was avoidable or unavoidable based on their clinical condition. For this resident, the surveyor is to investigate these following things. How the facility assessed and evaluated the individual resident's risk factors, what type of care plan interventions were developed, whether the interventions were consistently implemented, and how the facility monitored and reevaluated the care the resident received. If the facility has assessed the clinical condition of the resident, identified the risk factors for the pressure ulcers, developed and implemented the plan of care that is consistent with current standards of practice, and has monitored and reevaluated their interventions, the surveyor would then determine that the development of the ulcer was clinically unavoidable and that the facility was in compliance in this situation. That's why it is so important for surveyors and providers alike to have the knowledge about the processes that need to be in place to assure that good preventative care is provided. That's why I am so happy that CMS has gathered a panel of experts who can provide the information we need to make our determinations for assessments, risk factors, care practices, and special considerations for pressure ulcer treatment for the residents at the end of life. Yeah, Sharon, you've provided me with a convenient segue here because we have invited uh, some nationally known clinical experts to uh, provide us with the most up-to-date information about uh, the key clinical issues. So let me introduce some of them right now. First, uh, let me introduce Dr. Dan Berlowitz. Dr. Berlowitz is the director of the Center for Health, Quality, Outcomes, and Economic Research at the VA Hospital in Bedford, Massachusetts, and the vice chair for health services research at Boston University School of Public Health. He's an associate professor of medicine and has a clinical background in internal medicine and geriatrics. He's published over 80 research papers and review articles, many of which have dealt with pressure ulcers and quality of nursing home care. Dr. Berlowitz is currently the president of the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, which is commonly known, and you will tell me if I've got this right, the NPUAP, uh, as you members like to call it. He's also a member of the American Geriatric Society and the American College of Physicians and the Gerontology Society of America. Dr. Berlowitz. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. You know, probably a good place to start would be at the very beginning, and perhaps you can explain to our viewers exactly what a pressure ulcer is. Stan, I would be glad to. Any discussion of pressure ulcer prevention and treatment must begin with a basic understanding of what pressure ulcers are and how they develop. Specifically, I'll be describing the physiology of ulcer development and how to differentiate a pressure ulcer from other types of dermal ulcers. But before doing this, it is important to introduce some definitions. First, what is a pressure ulcer? Very simply, a pressure ulcer refers to any lesion caused by unrelieved pressure that results in damage of underlying tissue. While pressure ulcers often overlie a bony prominence, as is clear from the definition, this need not always be the case. Pressure ulcers may go by other names, including bed sores, pressure sores, and decubitus ulcers. However, pressure ulcer is definitely the preferred name. One of the most important features used in evaluating and describing a pressure ulcer is the stage. A staging system describes the extent of tissue damage, specifically depth of a pressure ulcer. Many different staging systems exist, but the one adopted by CMS was originally proposed by the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. In this staging system, a stage one ulcer is an observable pressure-related alteration of intact skin. The ulcer appears as a defined area of persistent redness in lightly pigmented skin, whereas in darker skin tones, the ulcer may appear with persistent red, blue, or purple hues. Compared to an adjacent or opposite area on the body, changes may include one or more of the following parameters. Skin temperature, including warmth or coolness, tissue consistency, such as firmness or bogginess, 
and sensation, including pain or itching. Two features of this stage one definition should be highlighted. First, there is no actual break in the skin yet. Second, the definition includes features other than erythema or redness. This is because erythema may be difficult to detect in people with darkly pigmented skin. Once the skin opens, the pressure ulcer is a higher stage. A stage two ulcer, as shown here, is defined as a partial thickness skin loss involving epidermis, dermis, or both. The ulcer is superficial and presents clinically as an abrasion, blister, or shallow crater. A stage three ulcer, shown in the slide, represents full thickness skin loss involving damage to or necrosis of subcutaneous tissue that may extend down to but not through the underlying fascia. The ulcer presents clinically as a deep crater with or without undermining of adjacent tissues. Finally, stage four ulcers are defined as full thickness skin loss with extensive destruction, tissue necrosis, or damage to muscle, bone, or supporting structures, such as tendon or joint capsule. Undermining and sinus tracts also may be associated with stage four pressure ulcers. This slide shows hardware from prior hip surgery that was exposed as a result of a stage four pressure ulcer. Because you can't see the wound bed, staging may be difficult if the wound is covered by eschar. Eschar is thick, leathery, black or brown necrotic tissue that adheres to the wound. It's important for surveyors to understand pressure ulcer staging as they observe and compare what they see with what's documented in the resident's record. For the purposes of documentation, the facility staff, when completing the MDS, must follow the Resident Assessment Instrument, or RAI, user's manual, which requires that pressure ulcers covered with an eschar be coded as a stage four. Dr. Berlowitz, would you describe what causes pressure ulcers to develop? Sharon, the traditional teaching is that pressure ulcers develop as a result of four external forces, pressure, shear, friction, and moisture. Of these forces, pressure is clearly the most important. Pressure may induce a process, may induce a process as shown here, in which there is occlusion of blood and lymphatic vessels, ischemia, interstitial edema, and hemorrhage, resulting first in muscle and subcutaneous tissue necrosis, and then epidermal and dermal necrosis. It is a widely held belief that a pressure of 32 millimeters of mercury is sufficient to occlude blood flow. Yet pressures with a standard hospital mattress often exceed 150 millimeters of mercury, and pressure on the ischial tuberosities when sitting may exceed 300 millimeters of mercury. In healthy adults, irreversible changes may occur within two hours of unrelieved pressure. The greater the pressure, the less time required to cause such damage. I believe that in some situations, severe tissue damage may occur with even less than two hours of pressure, but this remains a controversial issue. Dr. Berlowitz, that's such a critical component for staff to be aware of, that irreversible changes may occur with two hours of unrelieved pressure. Surveyors pay particular attention to interventions that staff are using for pressure redistribution. You also mentioned other external forces, such as friction and shear. Could you describe these, please? Shear forces occur when residents lie on an incline, because superficial skin layers don't move. While deep tissues are being pulled down by gravity, there is stretching and angulation of blood vessels. It is generally believed that less pressure is required to cause deep tissue injury when shear forces are present. Friction and moisture are different than pressure and shear, in that they result in maceration of skin. Friction is frequently caused by pulling a resident in bed so that the skin rubs against the bed sheets, but may also occur when the resident uses elbows or heels to reposition. Moisture may arise from many conditions, but urinary and fecal incontinence are the major causes. Only the superficial layers of skin are involved with friction and moisture. Consequently, the link to deep tissue injury remains uncertain. Dr. Leiter will be speaking subsequently and in greater detail regarding the role of pressure and moisture. So this emphasizes that any time a resident is repositioned, there might be the danger of friction injury. So as a surveyor, this would be a good opportunity for us to observe staff repositioning residents. Dr. Berlowitz, we've been talking about external forces of friction and shear. 
Are there any other factors that impact on pressure ulcer development? Certainly one must consider a variety of resident-specific or intrinsic factors that may predispose to pressure ulcer development. In particular, research has recently devoted considerable attention to the role of circulation. Many of the large pressure ulcers tend to develop during acute illnesses. These illnesses are often characterized by hypotension, dehydration, and vasoconstriction. As a result, there is a failure of the microcirculation. Very simply, blood flow to the skin does not increase appropriately in response to an external stress. This then is a major contributor to tissue ischemia. As a general rule, when a person is acutely ill and not perfusing vital organs, such as the kidneys and brain, it is unlikely that the skin will get adequate blood flow. While this may have a major role in pressure ulcer development in hospitals, its role in nursing homes is uncertain. This emphasizes, though, that tissue ischemia and deep tissue injury may be present even though there is intact skin. For example, on this slide, the dark purple lesion, we, we know there is deep underlying tissue damage, and that breakdown will be evident in a few days. While it is currently covered by intact skin, it is doubtful that any therapy could prevent a stage 3 or 4 ulcer from appearing within a few days. NPUAP is currently having ongoing discussions about this issue. So are you saying that a person who has intact skin and a deep tissue injury has a pressure ulcer? Yes, the person clearly has pressure-induced skin injury. Current recommendations are that staff document that as a stage one pressure ulcer using the MDS coding system. This is why it's so important for facility staff to conduct an accurate assessment on the resident's admission to the facility. An accurate admission assessment will help staff identify the resident at risk for developing a pressure ulcer and the resident who already has pressure ulcers or areas of compromised skin. This initial assessment will help staff to define and implement essential care approaches beginning at admission. And this type of documented information will help our surveyors, as well as the regulation language at F314 states that a resident who is admitted without a pressure ulcer does not develop a pressure ulcer unless it is clinically unavoidable. Dr. Berlowitz, as surveyors, we see a number of types of skin wounds. Would you provide us with information regarding the differences between pressure and non-pressure related wounds? Sharon, generally recognizing that a lesion is a pressure ulcer is not difficult based on its typical location overlying a bony prominence. An ulcer overly overlying the coccyx, ischial tuberosities, or greater trochanter is almost certainly pressure induced. However, sometimes it may be difficult to determine whether a lesion is a low stage pressure ulcer or some other lesion such as dermatitis. Dr. Leiter will be discussing this in more detail. Additionally, Pressure ulcers may sometimes develop in atypical locations, such as elsewhere on the buttocks, on the lower leg, or on the ears. Pressure ulcers in these atypical locations often result from the improper use of an appliance, or trauma induced by some other foreign object, such as catheter tubing, braces, or a cast. A large ring-shaped ulceration in the buttocks can result from leaving a person on the toilet or commode chair for a prolonged period whereas oxygen tubing may cause a pressure-induced lesion on the nose or ears. This emphasizes the need for detective work by clinical staff in determining whether a skin ulcer is pressure-induced or secondary to something else. Ulcers are particularly common on the feet and legs, and the differential diagnosis may be especially difficult. When pressure ulcers occur on the feet or legs, they are most likely to be located on the heels or lateral aspects of the ankle. In a resident with contractures, though, pressure ulcers may occur elsewhere, such as the medial or lateral aspects of the knee, as well as the palms or arms. Chronic venous insufficiency is the most common cause of leg ulcers. Venous insufficiency usually develops as a result of prior episodes of venous thrombophlebitis with associated destruction of valves in the deep venous system. This is an example of such a venous ulcer, also known as stasis ulcer. Very evident are the irregular margins, which may be heaped up. Typically, a venous ulcer will be located over the medial or lateral aspect 
of the, the medial aspect of the leg or ankle, but in severe cases such as this, it may extend around the leg. Other signs of venous insufficiency are often present, including leg edema, stasis dermatitis, and brownish hyperpigmentation of the skin related to hemosiderin deposition, as is evident in this slide. Pain is often not present, despite the large area of ulceration. How about other types of ulcers, such as those caused by arterial insufficiency? Sharon, arterial insufficiency is the second most common cause of leg ulcers. Skin ulceration results from tissue hypoxia caused by an inadequate blood flow, particularly when associated with even a minimal trauma. Ulcers typically occur over the toes and lateral aspects of the ankle or legs, as shown in this slide. They often have round margins, and they may be extremely painful. These ulcers may be associated with gangrene. Other signs of arterial insufficiency will usually be present, such as shiny, hairless skin, absent pulses, and coolness of the extremity. We also see ulcers occurring in residents with diabetes. Could you describe those ulcers for us? Neuropathic, or dystrophic ulcer, is another common cause of foot ulceration. These ulcers typically occur in persons with diabetes mellitus or other conditions that cause a neuropathy. The precise pathogenesis is not known, but it may be caused by reduced blood flow caused by the nerve damage or the simple inability to feel a traumatic injury. As shown on the slide, the sole of the feet, especially under the metatarsal heads, is a common location for neuropathic ulcers. Pain is typically absent, and a resident may be entirely unaware of an advanced ulcer. With pain typically being absent and the resident being unaware of the advanced ulcer, I can see the importance of facility staff being vigilant in the observation and management of the lower extremities for those residents who have diabetes. Are there other skin wounds that we'd like to address? Those I've covered are certainly the most common causes of ulcers encountered in nursing home residents. However, other conditions may rarely cause skin ulcers. These include a number of chronic infections, vasculitis, especially pyoderma gangrenosum, and skin cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma arising in a chronic wound should always be considered when a wound healing does not occur despite appropriate therapy. So then not all chronic wounds are alike, especially non-pressure related ulcers. I can see how important it is for facility staff to know the etiology of the ulcer in order to provide the specific treatment interventions for that particular type of ulcer identified. This will be helpful information for surveyors when they're reviewing and observing care for both pressure and non-pressure related wound care. Dr. Berlowitz, is it possible for a resident who has a non-pressure related ulcer to also have damage from pressure to this area? Sharon, that's a good question. There certainly may be an interaction among predisposing factors. Pressure likely is an important contributor to arterial and neuropathic ulcers. Well, thank you, Sharon, and uh, thank you, Dr. Berlowitz, uh, for this enlightening overview, if you will, of pressure ulcer development. Continuing on now with our presentation, we have had the opportunity to take a team into a nursing home setting to film a case study of a nursing home resident for our discussion. As we will be referring to Mr. Smith in our broadcast, I'd like to tell you a little about the gentleman. The resident, Mr. Smith, has a history of a left cerebral vascular accident. Although he can respond to verbal commands, he can't always speak nor say what he needs. Mr. Smith has several deficits in the area of activities of daily living, including that he is incontinent in urine and stool at least three times a day, and he needs staff assistance with grooming and dressing. Now, Mr. Smith's ability to walk is greatly impaired, and he spends most of his time in a chair and is unable to change positions himself. His current weight is 170 pounds, his height 5 feet 10 inches tall. In the past month, he has lost roughly 5 pounds. His latest serum albumin is 3.0. He is unable to use his right arm to feed himself, and despite assistance from the staff, he is only eating half of his meals, and he has difficulty swallowing, and he has a lack of appetite. His current medications include uh, antidepressants, anticholinergics, uh, multivitamins, and antiplatelets. 
And as we progress through our broadcast, uh, you will hear our expert panelists refer to Mr. Smith in relation to assessing his risk for pressure ulcer development and identifying some strategies that might be effective as a preventative plan of care. At this time, let me introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Aiello, who is a registered nurse and faculty member at Excelsior College School of Nursing in Albany, New York. She is a board-certified wound ostomy and incontinence nurse. Dr. Aiello is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing and a fellow of the American Professional Wound Care Association. She is the executive editor of the Journal of the World Council of, uh, let me see here, Enterostomal, if you will, astrostomal therapist. And Dr. Aiello serves as a senior advisor to the John A. Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing in New York City and is program director for Education Essentials. She is also the co-author and co-editor of the 2004 Lippincott publication, Wound Care Essentials, Practice and Principles. Dr. Aiello has served as president of the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. She is uh, chair of the uh, uh, NPUAP task force that revised the stage one pressure ulcer definition, associate editor of the NPUAP 2001 publication, Pressure Ulcers in America, Prevalence, Incidents, and Implications for the Future, and is the current chairperson of the Wound Ostomy Continence Nurses Society Accreditation Committee. I hope I got all of the credentials correct, doctor. Good to see you. Good My to see pleasure. You, Stan. Okay. Now, later in the program, we will talk live with Dr. Aiello, but first, she had a chance to talk with Sharon previously about the importance of assessing uh, for pressure, ulcer risk, and conducting skin assessments. So let's take a listen in on that conversation. I know sometimes people are confused between a risk assessment and a skin assessment. Would you discuss the difference? Sure, Sharon, and thanks for the opportunity to clarify this sometimes confusing distinction between two types of assessment, pressure ulcer risk and skin assessment. As nurses, we are like detectives looking for clues that guide us in making decisions about what is wrong with our residents and how we should proceed with the case. The skin can hold clues to the person's medical condition or the case. A skin assessment is different from a risk assessment because you are looking at the person's entire body for changes in the skin that might indicate a disease state or a need to change the plan of care. A pressure ulcer risk assessment is focused in that you are trying to decide if the person is at risk for developing the specific skin injury of a pressure ulcer. While there is no consensus in the literature as to what to include in a skin assessment, the usual clinical practice of a minimal skin assessment evaluates the following five elements, temperature, color, moisture, turgor, and integrity. Now let's look at these five areas in more detail. Temperature. The question is, is it warmer than normal? This might signal inflammation. Is it cooler than normal? This could signal poor vascularization. For color, paleness may indicate poor circulation. Hyper or hypopigmentation may reflect variations in melon deposits, blood flow, or even genetic disease. What about moisture? The questions are, is the skin dry or moist? Is there flaking, edema, or rashes present? Turgor, what is the person's hydration status, especially hydration deficits? Integrity, are there open areas? If so, use the correct classification system to identify the skin injury. Pressure ulcer assessment is about asking different questions. While a pressure ulcer risk assessment begins with assessing the condition of the skin over the bony prominences, it is more than skin. It encompasses looking at the whole person who lives in that skin and evaluating the factors that we believe that science has told us 
affect skin breakdown. So surveyors may see different types of assessments conducted on the resident. You had mentioned the use of a pressure ulcer risk assessment. CMS does not mandate that a facility use a particular assessment tool, so facilities are able to choose which tool is most suitable for their needs. As surveyors, we verify the accuracy of their assessments regardless of which tool they use. Yes, Sharon. Surveyors will see a variety of risk assessment tools in use. You might see the Norton, the Braden, the Waterloo, the Gosnell, and even homegrown scales. Assessing a resident for pressure ulcer risk is a comprehensive process, not something that can be wrapped up only into a scale. That's why it's so important to remember why a risk assessment is done in the first place. It's to identify which residents might get a pressure ulcer so that as nurses we can do something about it before it happens. By doing a risk assessment, we make a clinical decision about what to use and when to begin using prevention strategies so our resident does not get a pressure ulcer. Interventions are expected to be put into place so the outcome of the pressure ulcer does not develop. What constitutes a risk assessment? It involves many things. Remember, our role as a nurse is as detectives to see if our resident is at risk for pressure ulcer breakdown. So like any good detective, we can find the answer by asking questions such as, does the resident have diseases, conditions, comorbidities that affect the skin and thus place the resident at risk for pressure ulcer development? If so, what are they and can they be modified or treated? How stable is the resident's condition? Has the resident been to the hospital recently? Is there a repeated pattern of hospital admissions? That's an important clue. What is the nutritional status? Is the resident getting adequate nutrients so the skin cells can do their work? Some people have other factors that are easy to measure and are captured on many of the tools. Can they move? Do they have pain so that they don't want to move? Do they have sufficient cognition? Are they incontinent? It is looking at all of these puzzle pieces and putting them together and then making a good clinical decision as to what to do about the situation. Another question nurses can ask is, what does the skin look like? One of the most important things to look at is whether the resident had a prior pressure ulcer. So I may find that some facilities might have different pieces of the assessment in different parts of the resident's record. It just might not be a single tool. Surveyors can still validate all we need to know about the facility's assessment of risk with different tools for assessments. Yes, <laughs> it's like the pieces of a puzzle. Remember we said that pressure also risk assessment is more than simply evaluating the skin. There may not be one section of the record where everything is all wrapped up in one place. Easy for us to find. Sometimes, as skin detectives, we have to go looking for it. You mentioned earlier that it's very important to identify whether or not the resident had a history of a previous ulcer. Can you elaborate on this? Certainly. When assessing a resident for risk of pressure ulcers, it is important to ask the resident if he has ever had pressure ulcers, and if so, what was the location and how were they treated? Sometimes the residents are not able to tell you their history. So it is important to talk to responsible people who might be knowledgeable of the resident's history. Let's talk about a clinical example. Here's a resident who had a pressure ulcer on his heel, which healed after six months of treatment. It would be important to know that his heels are more vulnerable to breakdown as his care is being planned. That's interesting. Many would think that after an ulcer heals, the skin is tougher. But you're saying it's actually compromised and more prone to another ulcer in the same area. Exactly. The ability of the skin to tolerate pressure may be altered since the tinsel strength of wounded skin is 
80% of unwounded skin. Most people who experience pressure on their skin are going to do something about it. They will change positions. What if someone has lost sensation or the ability to feel pressure on their skin? You and I are going to get up and move when we feel that our bottom hurts from sitting in one position too long. I call it the commercial effect. I get up and move during the TV commercials. If they have dementia, if the skin has lost sensation, if the person cannot process what is happening to them, or doesn't have the knowledge of what to do, or cannot move about by themselves, they have lost the early warning sensor. That's the skin's ability to tolerate pressure, and it's being challenged. This resident is at risk, and staff must do for them what the resident cannot do for themselves. One intervention for a resident at risk for pressure ulcer development would be to redistribute the pressure. The kinds of support surfaces we may want to use may be different based on our analysis of the risk factors. It's like assessing the treatment for women who are pregnant. The medical treatment is different based on what trimester they are in and what their needs are specifically at that time. That reinforces the individualized approach to care in the first place. Yes. The degree to which a resident is at risk and the type of pressure ulcer risk will dictate what treatment is best. So what will this risk assessment tool say? If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Pressure ulcer scales were developed for research as a guide to quantify the degree of risk by assigning numeric values to pressure ulcer risk factors. Since it was helpful, it has been adopted for use in the clinical setting. I've seen the Norton scale more often than the Braden scale. Are there other tools? There are actually several risk assessment tools besides the Norton and Braden scale. There's the Waterloo, Gosnell, Knoll, and homegrown tools. AHRQ, formerly AHCPR guidelines, recommend that risk assessment be done using a validated tool and suggest that the Norton and Braden scales have a research base supporting their reliability and validity. While no specific tool other than the RAI is mandated, use of a pressure ulcer risk assessment tool is helpful for determining at-risk residents. Some nurses believe that intuition or informal pressure ulcer risk assessment is enough and using a pressure ulcer risk tool is unnecessary. Research supports that when a formal tool is not used, clinicians only intervene for persons at the highest level of risk. For example, in one study, fewer than 50% of patients at mild to moderate risk for developing pressure ulcers were turned. Research supports that when formal risk assessment is linked to preventative protocols, the incidence of pressure ulcers dropped by 60% and the severity and cost of pressure ulcers decreased too. So you're saying the total score by itself is enough? No. The global scores are not the end of the story. Two people may have the same total score, but they have that score based on different subscales, so they will need different components of treatment. Does it really matter if a facility chooses to use the Braden or the Norton? Can you explain the coding differences? Both scales have validity, but they are different. So it is important to know the correct way to use your facility's selected scale. The Norton scale is the grandmother of all pressure ulcer risk assessment scales. Created in the early 1960s, it was based on older persons in a hospital in the United Kingdom and it has five factors. Physical condition, mental condition, activity, mobility, and incontinence. Each factor is ranked numerically from a high score of four, meaning good, to a low score of one. Notice that nutrition is not a separate discrete factor. Doreen Norton believed that nutrition was integrated throughout each of the five factors, and so it is not a separate category. 
Let's look at a copy of the Braden scale and using the data about our resident, Mr. Smith, do a pressure ulcer risk assessment using the scale. The sensory perception subscale of the Braden scale has two levels. The top descriptors measure the person's level of consciousness, while the bottom descriptors measure cutaneous sensation. Because Mr. Smith can respond to verbal commands but can't always speak, his score for top subscale category of level of consciousness is slightly impaired, or three. Because he has paralysis and cannot feel pain over half of his body, his score on the bottom descriptor of cutaneous sensation is very limited, or two. If a person has a different score on each of these levels, the lower score is used. So for this resident, Mr. Smith, his score would be two for sensory perception. Looking at the moisture subscale, Mr. Smith is incontinent of urine and stool at least three times a day. So once a shift, he needs changing. Using the descriptors in the moisture category, his subscale score is very moist, or two. Under the activity subscale, because Mr. Smith sits in the chair most of the day, his score on the activity subscale is two for chair fares. Under the mobility subscale, Mr. Smith's ability to walk is greatly impaired from his CVA, and he is unable to change positions by himself. This makes him completely immobile and thus gives him a mobility subscale of one. Let's look at the nutrition subscale next. Mr. Smith has several factors which impact on his nutrition. He has difficulty swallowing, lacks an appetite, eats about half of his meals, even though staff is assisting him due to his problems of not being able to use his right arm and has lost five pounds in the past month. All these assessments support that his nutrition is probably inadequate and thus a subscore of two. And lastly, friction and shear. Because Mr. Smith has right-sided paralysis and needs so much assistance to change positions and walk, his friction and shear is a problem, giving him a subscore of one. So what's your clinical decision about Mr. Smith's risk for a pressure ulcer? By adding the six subscores, Mr. Smith's total Braden score is 10. The onset of pressure ulcer risk for the general population is 16. For elderly or darkly pigmented persons, the onset of risk score is at the higher number of 18. Numerical scores lower than these numbers mean that the person is at risk for developing pressure ulcers. But it's not just the singular number that's important. That's only part of the story. In fact, if we as nurses ignore the type of risk, then we are missing the point of a risk-based protocol. The tool by itself is not the critical piece. It is the ability to take the resident data and put it into the tool of choice. Then what is important is how you use what you have incorporated, how as skin detectives you determine the best approach or approaches and how to treat the issue. In either case, the resident had a score of 10. The number is not what is important, it is what the number represents. This resident is at risk. The facility must take action. So since Mr. Smith's Braden score is 10, he's at high risk for developing pressure ulcers. Don't just rely on the total score for deciding on when and what to implement for prevention protocols. It's also important to look at which subscales are lowest. For example, for Mr. Smith, it's mobility and friction or shear. By customizing your interventions to the lowest subscores first, it will address the most critical areas of pressure ulcer risk and also help with resource usage. When should surveyors expect to find a risk assessment? How often should they reassess? Well, research by Braden and Bergstrom has shown that the majority of pressure ulcers occur within the first three weeks of admission to a long-term care facility. Based on this, 
it's recommended that pressure ulcer risk assessment be done on admission, weekly for the first four weeks, and then monthly to quarterly. Whenever there is a change in the resident's condition, their pressure ulcer risk needs to be reassessed. After the surveyor has determined that the facility accurately assessed the resident at risk for pressure ulcers, what next? By looking at the clinical clues, we as skin detectives can come up with a plan of action to prevent skin injury. Clinical decision making based on our elements of risk assessment that we have discussed is the first step in solving the mystery of skin breakdown. Thank you, Dr. Aiello, for all that helpful information. This has helped me to further understand the difference between the two types of assessments, the significance of an accurate skin assessment and the identification of risk factors. Well, just a fascinating exchange of information about uh, pressure ulcers and uh, how to identify them, how to begin to treat them. Uh, Sharon, you engaged in the conversation with Dr. Aiello. I, I would imagine that uh, this would be a good point. To, we can get in some follow-up questions, right? Dr. Aiello, could you clarify for me about when to implement pressure ulcer prevention strategies? I mean, is it only when a resident has an overall score indicating that they are at risk? No, Sharon. This is missing the point of a risk assessment. Prevention protocols should be custom designed according to which pressure ulcer assessment subscale scores are low. What that means is the resident risk factors are high. Don't wait until the resident is at a highest risk. It's about knowing the unique risk factors of your resident and acting immediately to protect the skin from pressure damage. Yeah. One of the factors uh, mentioned by Dr. Aiello was the issue of nutrition as a risk factor. So let's look at a tape of a conversation that Sharon had with Dr. Berlowitz about the issue of nutrition. Dr. Berlowitz, during your presentation, Dr. Aiello identified undernutrition as a risk factor for the development of pressure ulcers. When surveyors are investigating the development of a pressure ulcer, they review the resident holistically, including how the facility identified the individual risk factors for the resident in question. For the resident in our case study, what should a surveyor look at concerning nutritional parameters? Sharon, that is an important question for surveyors to evaluate when they are assessing the facility's response to identified risk factors for an individual resident. Nutritional status has long been thought to be an important predictor of both the development and healing of pressure ulcers. Yet I believe there is no part of the risk assessment process that is more difficult than determining whether or not a nursing home resident is malnourished. This is certainly the situation for the case under discussion. There are many clues here that the resident, Mr. Smith, may have nutritional issues. He has lost five pounds in the past month. His albumin is 3.0, which is low. Moreover, he has difficulty swallowing, no appetite, isn't, and is unable to use his right arm for feeding himself. Based on this information, would Mr. Smith be considered to be malnourished? And are there specific nutritional interventions required? for reducing his risk for developing a pressure ulcer? Well, to begin the discussion of nutritional aspects of this case, we need to understand what is meant by malnutrition. Certainly, nursing home residents may have isolated deficiencies of important nutrients. Deficiencies of vitamin D and B12 are particularly common among nursing home residents. A zinc deficiency may be especially relevant for pressure ulcers. But these isolated deficiencies are not what we should consider as malnutrition. Rather, in thinking about risk for pressure ulcers, we should be most concerned with the specific condition of protein energy malnutrition. As the name implies, protein energy malnutrition arises when the intake of calories and protein is insufficient to meet the metabolic demands. Protein energy malnutrition arises through three main mechanisms. First, in some situations, it may arise solely from inadequate intake of nutrients. The resident is underfed. Second, malabsorption, in which nu nutrients are consumed but not absorbed, may contribute to underfeeding. 
But much more common in nursing home residents is a third mechanism, an increased requirement for energy and protein brought on by some stress such as injury or infection. Common causes of such stress may be a new bacterial infection, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic heart failure, or renal failure. In all these conditions, there will be hormonal changes and release of cytokines. This in turn will result in anorexia, the depletion of visceral protein stores, liver dysfunction, and malabsorption. Thus, a cycle may be generated of malnutrition leading to anorexia and malabsorption, resulting in further malnutrition. But the important point is to recognize that many cases of protein energy malnutrition arise from chronic illnesses present in nursing home residents and may have little to do with the care actually provided by the nursing home. During observations of meal services, surveyors observe the assistance provided by the staff to the residents who need it. When we observe a resident who's being assisted to eat, and that resident is not consuming the food item served, we investigate to determine if any of the clinical conditions you described are contributing to this problem. In those cases, the surveyor should be able to obtain this type of assessment information from the record review and interviews of the staff, including the physician, the dietitian, and nursing staff. It is important to verify assessment information with staff, as they should be able to provide the most up-to-date clinical information regarding the current status of the resident. Earlier you said we should be most concerned about protein energy malnutrition for those residents at risk for pressure ulcers. What should a surveyor be looking for? Sharon, that's a good question. The detection of protein energy malnutrition is often difficult and there is no single test that can make this determination. Rather, an array of assessments is required that provides information on overall nutritional status. The physical examination may reveal muscle wasting and loss of subcutaneous fat. The resident will appear thin, wasted, and cachexic. The skin may be dry and flaky. In rare cases, edema and ascites may develop. And the resident will often, but not always, be underweight. This should be determined by the body mass index, or BMI. This is calculated as the weight in kilograms divided by the height in meters squared. A BMI below 22 is often a cause for concern. Current BMI must of course be interpreted in light of any recent weight changes. A weight loss of 5% in one month or 10% over six months is usually considered significant. Such weight changes should reflect changes in fat and muscle and not fluids as may occur from a diuresis. As surveyors, those indicators of weight changes would certainly require investigation as to how the facility assessed and identified the changes in the individual resident's nutritional status. The requirement at 483.25i states that based upon a resident's comprehensive assessment, the resident maintains acceptable parameters of nutritional status, such as body weight and protein levels, unless the resident's clinical condition demonstrates that this is not possible. Are there other components of the assessment that surveyors should review? Laboratory assessments may be an important component of the nutritional assessment. The most commonly used test is the serum albumin level, which provides good evidence of protein stores. But albumin may be affected by many conditions other than nutritional status, and any physiologic stress may lower it. Thus, a low serum albumin does not always mean protein energy malnutrition. Sometimes a pre-albumin level is checked instead of the albumin, as this may be more sensitive to recent changes in nutritional status. Total lymphocyte count, cholesterol, transferrin, retinol binding protein, and skin test antigens may also be ordered by the practitioner as part of a comprehensive nutritional assessment. The identification of protein energy malnutrition also depends on a comprehensive history. Changes in appetite and dietary intake must be determined. This should be combined with a broader assessment that captures preferences for specific types of food and the ability to taste and enjoy foods. Reflecting this lack of a gold standard for malnutrition, no single marker has consistently been shown to be an independent predictor of pressure ulcer development. 
confounding the problem is that malnutrition is often associated with other risk factors for pressure ulcers, such as immobility. While some studies have identified a low serum albumin level as a predictor of pressure ulcers, other nutritional markers such as current inadequate intake of food were more important than albumin in other studies. This emphasizes that in determining pressure ulcer risk, a comprehensive nutritional assessment rather than any single test is required. That's helpful to know in evaluating the status of a resident's nutritional parameters. Based on these facts, would you consider the nursing home resident in our case study to be malnourished? The answer is most likely yes. His body mass index is low at 21, even though he did not lose 5% of his body weight in the past month. The albumin is also low at 3.0. He appears to have anorexia as only half of his food is being consumed. Moreover, he is post-stroke, a situation known to be associated with an almost 30% occurrence of protein energy malnutrition. Malnutrition should be addressed as part of the treatment plan. Well, for Mr. Smith, what are some of the things the facility should consider in order to prevent the pressure ulcers from occurring? This resident requires an aggressive nutritional intervention. It is worth noting, though, that while malnutrition appears to be associated with an increased risk of pressure ulcer development, the ability of nutritional interventions to lower this risk has not been conclusively shown. Four clinical trials have evaluated nutritional supplements provided either orally or by a tube in patients hospitalized with a critical illness or recent hip fracture. All of these studies had serious methodological concerns and many did not have sufficient numbers of residents to be able to show a meaningful difference. Yet collectively, the studies did suggest a benefit in terms of lower rate of pressure ulcer development. Whether these results apply to nursing home residents with their many chronic illnesses is unclear. Nevertheless, this lack of convincing evidence should not be taken as suggesting that nutritional supplementation is of no benefit in preventing pressure ulcers. As for Mr. Smith, he should receive an enhanced meal plan to provide the protein and calories he requires. Staff should be assessing his intake in order to determine if additional nutritional supplementation is warranted. I know that during observations of meal services, some residents who are not eating well will state that they are just not hungry and they have no appetite. In reviewing Mr. Smith's case, it looks like one problem contributing to this resident's poor nutritional status is anorexia. Would you please discuss the issues of anorexia? There are many causes of anorexia, and as I mentioned earlier, chronic illnesses and malnutrition may in itself induce anorexia. However, an important treatable cause of anorexia that should always be considered in nursing home residents is depression. This resident is already on an antidepressant, but the adequacy of this therapy should be reassessed. Sometimes, medications are used to stimulate the appetite. The two most commonly used medications are the progestational agent Megastrol acetate and the cannabis derivative Dronabinol. Most of the studies demonstrating the efficacy of these drugs have been performed on people with cancer or HIV infection. No firm guidelines exist for their use in nursing homes. Caution is required particularly for Megastrol acetate as it may predispose to deep venous thrombosis in residents who are already bedbound and immobile. Finally, Mr. Smith may have a problem with eating and feeding himself. Difficulty with swallowing is common post-stroke, although in most residents, this resolves in several weeks. A swallowing evaluation would be indicated in this resident, and alterations in the diet may facilitate swallowing. The right-sided weakness suggests that Mr. Smith may not be able to feed himself. An occupational therapist may be able to help him and close attention should be given to how the resident is currently being fed at mealtimes. In some nursing home residents, enteral feeding through a nasogastric or PEG tube has been considered as a way of providing nutritional supplements. Both short and long-term use may need to be considered. However, the benefits and risks of enteral feeding remain poorly defined and considerable regional differences exist in its application to nursing home residents. Decisions regarding enteral feeding should usually be made in conjunction with the resident and family members. I'm glad you brought up the point regarding enteral feeding. 
there is a nursing home requirement that states that based upon the comprehensive assessment, a resident who has been able to eat enough alone, or at least with assistance, is not to be fed by tube unless the clinical condition demonstrates that the use of a tube was unavoidable. Our guidance is clear that the intent of the requirement is to prevent the use of tube feeding when ordered over the objection of the resident or when it's not likely to be of benefit. We review to see if the decision about the appropriateness of tube feeding for a resident has been developed with the physician and the resident or his or her representative. This would also include a review of advanced directives regarding this issue if the resident has made an advanced directive. It is very important that the practitioners and the resident and his or her representatives are involved in the decision making regarding the nutritional interventions to be provided. So far we've discussed the role of nutrition and pressure ulcer prevention. What about the role of nutrition and pressure ulcer treatment? Nutritional status is one of the most important reversible factors contributing to wound healing and much of the previous discussion is also relevant to pressure ulcer treatment. A number of studies have suggested that dietary intake of protein is particularly important in healing pressure ulcers. The optimum dietary protein, though, is unknown, and current recommendations suggest 1.2 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram per day. Higher amounts should be avoided as it may promote dehydration. Individual nutrients, especially vitamin C and zinc, are often used to promote healing. While they may be of benefit in residents with an isolated deficiency of that nutrient, there is little evidence to suggest their benefit in most pressure ulcer patients. In summary, many nursing home residents have protein energy malnutrition. Careful attention to this problem will do much towards promoting their overall health status, as well as contributing to the prevention and treatment of pressure ulcers. Dr. Berlowitz, thank you so much. I find that information very helpful. I've seen records for residents with pressure ulcers and the doctor's orders will say to administer zinc for healing. My understanding was that this is a controversial issue and that zinc is necessary for pressure ulcer healing. Can you elaborate? The use of, zinc, of a zinc supplement is certainly a common practice, yet clinical trials have not demonstrated that zinc supplementation results in improved healing for the majority of pressure ulcer patients. There may be isolated residents, though, in whom it would benefit. The difficult issue is how to identify these very few residents. Just for clarification, you had mentioned the use of nutritional supplementation in nursing homes. We see the use of liquid supplements frequently. Could the use of small, more frequent, high-nutrient meals serve the same purpose? Yes, it can serve that purpose. The important point, though, is ensuring that residents receive adequate nutrition through any means. All too often, nutritional supplements are used in place of a resident's normal meal, and that may be problematic. All right. Thank you, Dr. Berlowitz. We are going to move on in our discussion now uh, and discuss some other risk factors of pressure ulcer development. I'd like to introduce Dr. Courtney Leiter, who is a University of Virginia Medical Center professor of nursing and a professor of internal medicine and geriatrics an interim chair of the Department of Acute and Specialty Care at the University of Virginia, and he recently moved to his new position from Yale University, where he was a tenured associate professor of nursing and gerontology and director of the Adult Family Gerontological and Women's Health Division at the School of Nursing. Dr. Leiter is a fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, diplomat of the American Academy of Wound Management, and former president of the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. He has over 145 publications, including books, book chapters, journal articles, and abstracts. His writings can be found in journals such as the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Archives of Internal Medicine, and American Journal of Surgery. He sits on the editorial advisory boards of Advances in Skin and Wound Care, Ostomy, Wound Management, and the International Wound Journal. He's given over 200 lectures throughout the United States and abroad. Dr. Leiter, welcome and good to see you once again. Good to see you, Stan. Okay. Uh, as we had discussed before, uh, you know, you had a chance to do a live interview uh, during this interview uh, with Sharon, and the two of you had a chance to talk uh, previously about things like moisture, friction, shear, and pressure redistribution. So before we go into an extended conversation, let's take a look at that interview that the two of you did. Great. Dr. 
Slider, during our surveys, part of our tasks include the record review, and one of the responsibilities is to evaluate the comprehensive assessment that's completed by the staff for a resident who has a pressure ulcer or who has been identified at risk for the development of pressure ulcers. This assessment usually identifies several factors that place the resident at risk for the development of a pressure ulcer. Surveyors review the care plan to identify the approaches that staff developed to address the identified risk factors. Risk factors of moisture and conditions that lead to unrelieved pressure. Would you please discuss the relevance of the evaluation of moisture as a risk factor? Sharon, you are right. There are many risk factors associated with pressure ulcer development. Moisture, in particular perspiration, urinary and fecal incontinence can increase the development of pressure ulcers by altering the integrity of the skin. When residents are diaphoretic, it is possible that excessive skin wetness can increase the friction gradient between skin and the external surface while the resident is being turned or repositioned. Further, prolonged exposure to skin wetness may lead to maceration, predisposing the resident to pressure ulcer development. Both urine and fecal incontinence have been implicated in pressure ulcer development. When the skin is exposed to these two substances for an extended period of time, it will increase the possibility of maceration. Furthermore, both urine and feces contain substances that are irritating to the skin. In particular, several studies have found that fecal incontinence is a better predictor of pressure ulcer development, since feces contain greater irritants than urine. Clearly, the type and frequency of incontinence will predispose the skin to breakdown. That's important information, but how does this relate to Mr. Smith, our case study? Well, in our case study, Mr. Smith is most susceptible to the effects of moisture on his skin. He is both incontinent of urine and stool with three daily incontinent episodes. Research has found that three or more incontinent episodes may place him at a higher risk for the development of perineal dermatitis as well as pressure ulcers. That is why it is also important for the nursing staff to delineate between pressure ulcers and perineal dermatitis, which can also be caused by incontinence. I can see how important it is for the care plan to address the issue of moisture in order to help reduce the potential for friction and shear during repositioning and to decrease the potential for dermatitis. Sometimes dermatitis has been confused with the development of a stage one pressure ulcer. Dr. Leiter, what is the difference? What should surveyors look for? And could you clarify this issue as well? Yes. As Dr. Brolowitz discussed earlier, pressure ulcers are due to the amount of time and pressure needed to obstruct normal capillary closure, leading to tissue necrosis. Pressure ulcers can range in stages one through four. Pressure ulcers precipitated by incontinence will usually appear as a stage one or stage two. Most often, pressure ulcers are a single lesion and quite circumscribed. Conversely, Perineal dermatitis often appears as a diffuse area of erythema. A perineal dermatitis is usually located where the incontinence has come into contact with the skin. The erythema tends to be more diffuse and covers a larger area. Dermatitis is commonly associated with itching, papules, and weeping skin. When the skin is not protected from the effects of the irritants, it may even ulcerate. In our case study, the goal for Mr. Smith is to maintain his skin integrity by monitoring his skin condition and providing care as needed. His skin should be assessed daily, paying particular attention to the most vulnerable anatomical areas for ulceration, the coccyx, sacrum, trochanters, and heels, which are most likely to develop pressure ulcers. If soiling with fecal matter or urine should occur, the skin should be cleansed with warm water and a mild cleansing agent to minimize irritation and dryness of the skin. Moisturizers should also be used if the skin appears dry. Massaging erythematic bony prominences should be avoided, since it has been found not to increase circulation, but rather increase degenerated tissue. Given Mr. Smith's multiple incontinent episodes, the use of a moisture barrier should be used after each incontinent episode. That was helpful information on assessing for moisture and providing concepts for care planning. You also mentioned paying particular attention to the four most vulnerable anatomical areas for ulceration, 
the coccyx, the sacrum, trochanters, and heels. Talk to us about excessive pressure on the skin in these areas. There is little discourse that excessive pressure over a period of time may result in a pressure ulcer development. Thus, a major preventive intervention should be removing or redistributing the pressure-sensitive areas of the body. Few studies on repositioning have been published since the Lamarck study on repositioning in 1964. This prospective observational study found that older adults, when repositioning two to three hour intervals, developed less pressure ulcers than the less frequently turned cohorts. A more recent study investigating 48 healthy older adults found a significant increase in skin surface temperature at the end of a two hour turning schedule. An increase in skin surface temperature can suggest early stages of pressure ulcer development, thus repositioning and offloading is essential. An example is our case study, Mr. Smith, has lost the ability to reposition himself. Thus, the nursing home staff must pay particular attention to repositioning or offloading him while in bed or chair. Diagram 1 indicates the pressure areas of most concern depending on the position that Mr. Smith is placed. When Mr. Smith is lying on the bed, he should be turned maximally every two hours. When reactive hyperemia of more than five minutes is noted, the frequency of repositioning should be increased. Prolonged reactive hyperemia has been noted to be a precursor to the development of a pressure ulcers. Ideally, the head of Mr. Smith's bed should be at the lowest degree of elevation, hence no greater than 30 degrees, which is consistent with his medical condition to decrease friction and shear forces. If he has to have the head of the bed elevated, then the nursing home staff should consider the use of wedge cushions or pillows to decrease the forces of friction and shear. Moreover, the use of draw sheets or trapeze should be used to reposition him to decrease mechanical forces. That information will help me as a surveyor when observing a resident who's on bed rest. What else does a surveyor need to be aware of when a resident is in a chair or in a recliner and has issues with positioning and offloading? In our case study, when Mr. Smith is sitting in a chair, he should be offloaded, hence relieved of all pressure on his seating surface every hour. It should be noted that when offloading Mr. Smith in his chair, he should be completely removed off the chair for one minute to facilitate tissue reperfusion. In Mr. Smith's case, he cannot be taught to offload independently. However, if the resident can be taught to shift his weight while seated, he should be taught to offload every 15 minutes. Good postural alignment is also essential to decrease the forces of friction and shear while the resident is sitting. After positioning the resident in the wheelchair, the nursing home staff should always think, have I accomplished proper postural alignment, proper distribution of weight, proper balance and stability, proper pressure redistribution? Since the majority of residents spend some time sitting in a chair, the use of pressure redistributing devices should be used. Some of those seating devices include foam, gel, air, or combination seating surfaces. However, donut-type devices should not be used since they do not evenly redistribute pressure. The physical therapy department can often assist the staff with determining the best alignment, seating surface, or whatever for the resident and thus should be consulted on a regular basis. I can see that relieving the excessive pressure from the tissue over time is an important intervention for the prevention of pressure ulcers. But surveyors have heard many times how difficult it is for staff to remember that they need to frequently change a resident's position. What have you seen facilities do in this case? For some nursing home staff, it may be difficult to remember turning intervals. Thus, the use of turning clocks, audible sounds, or music that would trigger the staff that is time to turn and reposition the resident could be used. Dr. Lida, you mentioned reactive hyperemia in relation to unrelieved pressure. What should a surveyor expect the nursing home staff to assess in relation to the skin and color changes that might happen when pressure is unrelieved? The skin should be assessed on a daily basis for those residents at risk during bathing and routine skin care. When the skin is assessed on a daily basis, it helps to ensure that any alterations can be identified and interventions can be implemented quickly. During the observations, color changes to the skin may have occurred. 
much confusion still exists between identifying reactive hyperemia and stage 1 pressure ulcers. The reactive hyperemia is often the first external sign that ischemia due to pressure has occurred. When the skin becomes ischemic under pressure for more than a minute, it becomes reddened or hyperemic after the pressure has been relieved. The rush of blood back into the ischemic tissue is noted as reactive hyperemia. This protective mechanism of the body dilates the vessels and increases the amount of blood available to oxygenate the tissue. The increase in blood flow has also been associated with increase in skin temperature and swelling in the ischemic area. Although difficult to quantify, reactive hyperemia usually lasts up to 50% less than a true pressure ulcer. Thus, reactive hyperemia can last as little as one minute and up to one hour. If pressure exceeds tissue tolerance, the mechanisms of reactive hyperemia becomes insufficient to meet the demands of the compromised circulation. Research has found that sustained pressure results in persistent tissue ischemia, leading to the accumulation of met metabolic breakdown products, failure of cellular membrane integrity, and tissue necrosis with perivascular hemorrhage. Thus, inflammation and extravasation of red blood cells results in persistent erythema consistent with a stage one pressure ulcers. Repetitive cycles of prolonged pressure with tissue ischemia preceded by pressure relief and return of blood flow can lead to reperfusion injury, which contributes tissue damage and further ulcer progression. Based on the literature, there appears to be a clear link between reactive hyperemia and stage one pressure ulcers. Therefore, it is essential to properly relieve the pressure while reactive hyperemia is still present, thus avoiding the development of a stage one pressure ulcer. This certainly reinforces the need to be vigilant in assessing the condition of the skin during repositioning and offloading for the resident. There's been a lot of research on the classification of stage one pressure ulcers and a lot of ongoing dialogue about the identification of stage one ulcers, especially in residents with darkly pigmented skin. Could you tell us more about this? There is more variability in research that attempts to classify the stage one pressure ulcer than in any other ulcer. The majority of classification systems define the stage one pressure ulcer as non-blanching erythema. These classification systems also note that reactive hyperemia will develop if pressure is unrelieved. However, if pressure continues to be unrelieved, it will eventually lead to non-blanching erythema. Thus, reactive hyperemia, or blanching erythema, is often noted as the precursor to a stage one pressure ulcer. In 1998, the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel revised its definition of a stage one pressure ulcer to encompass the skin alterations that might be seen in stage one pressure ulcers regardless of skin pigmentation. This definition notes that a stage one pressure ulcer is an observable pressure-related alteration of intact skin whose indicators, as compared to the adjacent or opposite area of the body, may include changes in one or more of the following. Skin temperature, warmer or cooler, tissue consistency, firm or boggy, or sensation, pain or itching. The National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel definition further states that the pressure ulcer appears as a defined area of persistent redness in lightly pigmented skin, but in darker skin tones, the pressure ulcer may appear with persistent erythema, blue or purple hues. For example, residents with dark brown skin, the erythema will usually appear as blue compared to the adjacent area of the body. A resident with black skin the erythema will most likely appear as purple compared to the adjacent area. The National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel classification of the stage one pressure ulcer is the only classification that includes non-white skin. This is a very important since most clinicians have little experience detecting stage one pressure ulcers in darkly pigmented skin. In assessing erythema, quantity and quality of the light source may alter skin color hues and thus impede most clinicians' ability to accurately assess skin color changes. The use of skin temperature, tissue consistency, 
and skin sensation as possible indicators of stage 1 pressure ulcers may make identifying pressure ulcers more accurate. Skin temperature elevations has been associated with the inflammatory phase of tissue ischemia. Hence, the warmth to the ischemic area can be attributed to increases in local blood supply, coupled with edema and engorgement of surrounding vessels. Conversely, coolness to the erythematic area has been attributed to decreased blood flow due to destruction of capillaries. Thus, both warmth and coolness indicate that tissue injury has occurred and potentially indicates the duration of injury. Hence, warmth being recent with coolness representing less recent. This sounds like a difficult area for assessment. Are there any technologies in the field that might help in the identification of this stage of pressure ulcer development? There have been numerous advanced skin technologies developed to measure tissue perfusion. However, no technologies have been specifically developed to detect stage 1 pressure ulcers. Although these technologies are not used by most nursing homes, they can be utilized. The most promising advanced skin measurement technologies due to their non-invasive methods and portability are thermography, spectroscopy, and portable ultrasound. All three technologies do not require differentiation between light pink and darkly pigmented skin. For example, ultrasound is based on acoustic waves traveling through tissue, hence portable ultrasound is colorblind and not dependent on skin pigmentation. I haven't heard about thermography. What is it? Thermography measures skin thermal patterns. Because blood flow causes the core body temperature to rise to the surface, alterations in blood flow may alter skin temperature. It is believed that 95% of adults will only deviate about 3 Celsius from one anatomical location to the other. Thus, permanent tissue trauma, such as pressure ulcer, should have a skin temperature variance as compared to the adjacent skin. Spectroscopy is new to me as well. What's this all about? Spectroscopy, also called tissue reflectance spectrometer, measures blood content in the microcirculation of the skin by quantifying hemoglobin. Dermatologists have long been interested in studying changes in skin color during and after treatment using this technology. I have heard about ultrasound. Could you tell us more about this? Ultrasound has been utilized for diagnosis over the last two decades. However, only recently has it been applied to studying tissue damage and healing. Dyson and colleagues used a high frequency and ultrasound and therefore high resolution ultrasound to detect dermal response to pressure and to monitor wound characteristics such as depth, edema, scar tissue and granulation tissue. It's good to see how technology continues to advance in the areas of assessing and evaluating the types of tissue changes that occur. Now for our case study we didn't use any of the newer technologies in assessing the skin changes. How would you assess the skin integrity of Mr. Smith? For Mr. Smith, who has light pink skin, it was noted that he had a hyperemic areas on three turning surfaces that lasted approximately one hour. At this juncture, the nursing home staff decided to place him on a group two support surface to better redistribute his pressure. You mentioned the use of group two support surfaces. What different types of support surfaces might a surveyor see used in nursing homes? The use of support surfaces on beds is an important consideration in helping to redistribute pressure. It has long been believed that support surfaces fall into two groups. Pressure reducing support surfaces, which reduce pressure but not completely below 32 millimeters of mercury, and pressure relieving support surfaces, which reduce pressure below 32 millimeters of mercury. However, Within the last few years, the world community has embraced the concept of pressure redistribution, which notes that since we can never totally relieve pressure, the best we can do is redistribute pressure. For example, if we relieve pressure on the heels, we will most likely increase pressure somewhere else on the body. Group 1 devices are those support services that are static. They do not require electricity. Static devices include air, foam, whether the foam is convoluted or solid, gel and water overlays or mattresses. 
These devices are ideal when a resident is at low risk for pressure ulcer development. They redistribute pressure, may decrease sharing, and are relatively inexpensive. If foam is used, it should be 1.3 pounds per cubic foot and greater than 3 inches. Group 2 devices are powered by electricity, or pump, and are considered dynamic in nature. These devices include alternating and low air loss mattresses. These mattresses are good for residents that are moderate to high risk for pressure ulcers or have full thickness pressure ulcers. The advantages of alternating air mattresses include portability, redistribution of pressure, reduction of sharing, and they are moderately priced to purchase or rent. The disadvantage, however, of these mattresses is their inability not to reduce heat accumulation on the resident's body. The advantages of low air loss mattresses are pressure reduction, low moisture retention, and reduction of heat accumulation. The disadvantage, however, of low air loss beds is that they can be expensive to purchase or rent. Finally, group three devices are also considered dynamic in nature. This classification comprises only air fluidized beds. These beds are electric and contain silicone coated beads. When air is pumped through the bed, the beads become liquid. They are used for residents at very high risk for pressure ulcers. More often, they are used for residents with non-healing full thickness pressure ulcers or when there are numerous truncal full thickness pressure ulcers. The advantages of air fluidized beds are their ability to redistribute pressure and to reduce heat accumulation, moisture retention, and shearing forces. The major disadvantages of these beds